photography is a way of feeling, of touching and of choosing a moment in time. Photography is the story that is somehow impossible to put into words. But when images become inadequate, I'll be content with the silence of the moment. Seeking the imperceptible yet faint glow of light in the darkness. It's about finding something magical in an ordinary place. The pictures are simply our imagination based on a fragment of reality. A fleeting moment yet somehow frozen in that special place between our inner yearning and our mind, our intellect and our passion, our heart and our soul. And so, what of the light? A ray of sunshine? A shimmering reflection? Or perhaps a glimpse into the unseen? Regardless of anything else, light is life. Light is hope. And light is what we need to survive. Give me light and I'll give you a way to find peace in the chaos, a calm in the storm, and a genuine window into the very heart of our creativity. What is the night if not a collection of majestic sparkles in an otherwise bland and formless void? No, it's far more than that. It's a place to rest and to regenerate, to bathe in the halo of a fresh beginning, to give something back to the universe where it all began. Reflection, luster, a glimmer of hope, a sparkle and a twinkle, an aurora, a halo, something special and so precious to our well-being. Light is what makes our dreams become reality. Light gives us a way to look forward. Light is the glue that connects our imagination with our ability to see. Light gives instant strength in times of darkness and nothing is more important for us to live and live that life in all its radiance and fullness. How we see and perceive light is what really matters. I'm very pleased to see you again here on the channel and as always I really do appreciate your ongoing support. Today we're going to discuss a topic that's probably my favourite subject, lighting for nightscape images. But before we get into that, I want to remind you to download the workshop guide as well as the shooting guides that I've showed you before on the link down below. That link will take you to my website where you'll see all the info you need to get those files. As well as that, you'll see a link to PayPal so you can financially contribute to this workshop series if you feel led to do so. Remember, this content is going out free to air on YouTube and there is absolutely no obligation to pay for it. But every little bit helps this humble photographer. The other exciting thing I've included in this workshop series are downloadable RAW files so you can have a go at editing my images and these are also listed on the web page. You'll remember last week we talked about creative composition and I thought it would be good to remind you of the key points we mentioned in that video. Firstly, it's very important to get to know how your camera works. Learn its features, because if you don't, your lack of understanding of the technical aspects of photography will get in the way of your creativity. Practice pre-visualization of the shot. Work out where the Milky Way will be in the sky, so you can compose the foreground to match. Have a good look at the surrounding landscape and especially look for obstacles in the background that may spoil the look of your image. Get the camera down low to emphasize your foreground subjects. Make use of leading lines, rule of thirds and other important photographic principles. And last of all, make sure you have good focus before shooting. There's nothing worse than getting home only to find that all your images are out of focus. And I can tell you that from experience, that hurts a lot. So with all that in mind, let's move on to what I consider to be the most exciting Sorry and- Sorry to interrupt. Oh. <laughs> Thought you might like a cup of- Oh, of course I do. And oh, I went to that. the bakery and got you a little something. Oh, fantastic. What have we got here? My favorite. <laughs> it's a rum ball. Have a look at that. Now, by the way, this is my wife, Glennis. And Glennis is a big part of our Nightscape Photography workshops here in Australia. 
So uh, say hello to everybody, Glennis. Hi, everybody. Now, she looks after people. She does all the cooking, as you can see. Well, this is from the bakery, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> she does all the cooking and she looks after people and entertains us. And uh, it's fantastic. And we love having her on board. And uh, it's really good out there, isn't it? It's fantastic. Now, we do now it. these folks aren't able to um, have any of your cooking or anything like that, but we're still doing a workshop online. So. Yes. Uh, look, I'm going to have to have a break now because I've got morning smoko and uh, I'll get back to you guys in just a minute. <laughs> Let's go. All right, well that was a pretty welcome distraction to be absolutely honest with you. So let's go back to where I was before. So with all that in mind that I've been talking about, let's move on to what I consider to be the most exciting and creative part of our night photography lighting for nightscape images. Now this would have to be one of the most challenging parts of photography and one which I've spent the best part of a couple of decades working through. Now the basic premise of photography is to capture light. Usually this is sunlight, sometimes directly or perhaps reflected off water, mountains, uh, clouds or other subjects depending on what it is we want to capture. Now I mentioned in the intro to this video that light is life. Now that may sound somewhat dramatic, but it's a fact that with light comes heat and with heat comes life. I find it amazing that our sun, which is the primary light source in our solar system, can provide all the light and the warmth we need to survive on this planet. Okay, now I don't wanna to get too heavy, so let's bring it back to how this comes into play in a photography setting. It's pretty obvious really. The camera sees the light bouncing off our subject and captures that light, turning it into a digital signal and in doing so into an image on the rear screen of our cameras as well as our SD card. Needless to say, we need light to practice photography. So taking that a step further, we also need light to capture our nightscape images and this is where a lot of us get somewhat confused. Many people will say to you that a proper night image needs to only have the light from the stars or perhaps a touch of moonlight. That, that's the only genuine nightscape as far as they're concerned. Others will argue that photography is all about how we perceive the image to look like and we can see all manner of lit features in the nightscape in our imagination. To some degree, this comes back to the science versus faith issue. Or to put it better, perhaps, it's what we can see versus what we can imagine. Hmm, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? What I'd like to do in this episode is cover a bit of both of these angles, if you like. I'll try to put a framework around the best use of lighting for our nightscapes and when and how to simply make use of the natural light in the environment. Now that sounds simple, doesn't it? But I can tell you right now, it's not as simple as it sounds. But I did promise you way back in episode one that I'd try to make complicated photography principles sound simple. Well, let's see how we go with this one. As we've already discovered, nightscape photography really pushes our camera equipment to the limit. It's really dark out there. And of course that means we need to boost our exposure as much as possible in camera just to see anything on the screen. As we've seen, we need to push up the ISO to insane levels to get a decent exposure for the night sky. But where the noise really hits us in the face is in the foreground. If you zoom in on a lot of images, you'll see hideous amounts of noise hiding in the shadow areas of our shots. I want you to remember this as it's a key point. Noise hides in the shadows. If we want to combat noise, we must first work out how to overcome this inherent issue. Now, what's quite interesting again in this discussion is that I'll be addressing two separate issues we have when talking about shooting and lighting nightscape images. Firstly, the technical challenge and then the creative challenge. Here we go again. There's always seems to be this constant battle between the two sides of the photography coin, technical versus creative. And where people struggle the most is in differentiating between the two. 
I've mentioned this many times and I'm sure I'll do so again, but if we can't master the technical aspects of photography, things like how the camera actually works and why we need to apply certain camera settings, then we'll never fully appreciate the complexities of creating a compelling and or inspiring image. And this applies even more so with nightscape photography because all the challenges are magnified many times over. Remember I mentioned the line and I drew that line in the sand in our previous video and how we are all wired either to be primarily technical or creative. It's built into our DNA and it takes lots of persistence and dedication to move ourselves a little closer to that center point where we start to get an understanding of things that seem quite foreign to us at first. So I hope you're getting an understanding of why I keep bringing this up. It's just so important to hear this. The majority of photographers have never even considered these things. All they do is work out camera settings, go outside and take images. Some will be great while others, well you get my point. Camera settings by themselves will never enable you to take an awesome image, especially at night when it's much harder than ever to get a shot. Okay, I'd like to discuss the various methods of lighting a nightscape image. Why do we need to light our images? Well, it's as simple as being able to place our night sky into an interesting location. If you look at these examples, you'll see the difference between simple unlit nightscapes compared to those where the foreground has some lighting applied and therefore definition. Okay, so method number one for shooting nightscapes is to make use of moonlight. The moon is a natural light source and it provides an easy option to get all the details in one shot as long as it's not too bright. If you look at these two images, you'll see how much light the moon can actually provide. The image on the left is taken at 2.30 a.m. with about a 30% crescent moon, while the image on the right is taken about an hour later when the moon had set. Exactly the same settings, but with the moon gone, a little bit of light painting gives the old shed some definition. But the biggest difference is in the detail in the night sky. These are both single shots, and you can hardly see the Milky Way in the moonlight shot. It's almost completely washed out. Now isn't that interesting? In this image, you'll also notice how the color tone of the sky changes when shooting with moonlight. This usually requires a change in our white balance settings, and I'll get onto that in a minute. Having said that, some of my all-time favorite images were shot with moonlight as the only light source. But I must add that I'm careful not to shoot when the moon is so bright as to wash out the sky too much. The gentle light of the foreground is wonderful, and I strongly encourage you to give moonlight photography a go. One of the greatest advantages to having moonlight is that it can light a scene that otherwise would be impossible to do so. For example, a distant mountain range or a village hidden at the bottom of a valley. It would be impossible to throw light from a torch that far and get acceptable results. So, how else can we light our nightscapes? Well, I'm glad you asked because you may be surprised just how effective random passing traffic can be in actually lighting a night image. Here, you can see the effect of car and truck headlamps on a foreground. These are all single exposures, so it can be tricky to get the timing right, but when you do, the results can be outstanding. The biggest thing to consider when capturing nightscapes with the help of a passing vehicle is to make sure you don't capture too much light and blow out the image. Because our camera settings are optimized for capturing faint stars, we can easily overexpose the foreground. You don't need to capture the headlamp lighting for the full duration of the shot. Often a few seconds is enough to get the desired effect. Okay, so we've looked at a couple of methods to light our foregrounds, but they're both a little bit out of our direct control. Let's look at the methods I use to light my foregrounds using various handheld light sources. Okay, so I've done a lot of talking about lights and about uh, concepts and ideas, but I want to show you the actual lights that I use for all of my nightscape images. I want to show you the reasons I use these particular lights. Now, firstly, I have to show you this one. This is my standard light painting torch. It's a LED Lenser P7.2. I've showed you this plenty of times before. Uh, it's, it's a torch, a flashlight. Now, it's not 
overly bright. And I think this is the thing to consider. When doing most of my light painting, I don't want too much light. And the reason for that is because when we're shooting these things at night time, a little bit of light goes an awful long way. So this is my number one go-to light. Now, as far as uh, seeing my way around in the dark, I use this. Now this is a thousand lumen torch. It's quite bright, as you can see. It's much brighter than the LED lens. And now the LED, this is about 350. And, and most of the time I'm operating this on its lowest setting. This particular one, by the way, I just use it to see my way around in the dark. Now, a lot of you are going to be saying, oh, well, gee, I use a headlamp. Well, you know, sometimes I do use a headlamp and I do have one. Here it is. This is actually a really good one. It's a LED Lenser brand as well. As you can see, it's pretty bright. But you know, I hardly use it. And I suppose the reason I don't use this headlamp very often is because I, I just don't like it on my head. I don't like the feel of the weight. It's got a battery pack on the back of it. Uh, it's quite large and it, it's got great light level low. And I have actually used this a couple of times to light a foreground subject. I remember I was over the Grampians once and I used this to actually light something because I didn't have a whole lot of stuff with me. I'd, I'd sort of hiked into this area and I wasn't able to bring too much stuff. And this light was pretty good for that. So it's a good solid light. Now, here we have my Z96 video light. Now you've seen this plenty of times. I've illustrated the use of this light many, many times. It's perfect for low level lighting. So I'm going to talk about low level lighting more, but suffice to say, you can dim this right down to almost nothing. Then I can put the orange gel. You can see it's got the magnetic gel and that just goes on the front there. And then I can put this light on something and leave it on a very low level, therefore the term low level lighting, and uplight a building. Or I can put it underneath trees and that's something that I do with this quite a lot uh, because I love the look of having uplit trees in the distance as part of my nightscapes. And the other thing I'll do is put it inside buildings or inside trucks or, or vehicles. So it's really, really handy. The other thing I can do, by the way, is I can put another magnetic gel on the front and just stack them and make it even more orange. And that contrasts really nicely sometimes with the cooler white balance of other lights that are in the scene. And I really, really like that. Really reliable light. I've had it for years. Very good quality. Now, this is another little one that I often use similarly to that one. Uh, this one I also pretty much only use as a low level light. So uh, you can see in this picture here, I put it inside the truck just to light the cabin of the truck. And it does a pretty good job. It's uh, small and light. It's got an inbuilt battery. So I don't have to worry about batteries with this one. It's just got a USB charger. It's um, Aperture brand, M9, yeah. So it's pretty common. You can also put gels over the top of this. Now, one thing about this one I forgot to mention, it has a Sony battery. And you can see on the back here, let me just open it up, Sony NPF battery. I have a, a lot of these batteries and they're really good. You can also put in this particular one, you can put AA batteries in there. Those batteries last for so long. They are really, really long lasting and I thoroughly recommend those batteries. Okay, now just whilst we're talking about floodlights, because ultimately there's uh, uh, two types of lighting that you're using for nightscapes. One is flood lighting, which are these bigger ones. Uh, and this is another one of those. And the other one is more, uh, in very general terms, spotlighting. Now, my torch I use for light painting is a spotlight. I can zoom it it comes into a narrow beam. And I really, really like the fact that I can do that because then I can squeeze light into small spaces. This, on the other hand, is another flood layer. It's a, it's a multi LED panel. And this is also quite good for low level lighting. It gets down to a fairly low level, not quite as low as the other one. But the thing I love about this one is you can change the color. Have a look at that. I can actually change from uh, a 5600 Kelvin, which is daylight, down to 3200 Kelvin, which is actually uh, tungsten lighting. So that's really handy as well. I don't need to put gels on the front of this one. And I think that is a really good feature of this particular light. It also has the Sony NPF battery. So that's another plus for these. Not that expensive either. Okay, now th these are loom cubes. Now, to be absolutely honest with you, I have a love-hate relationship with loom cubes. 
I've got quite a few of them, but I hardly ever use them. And I thought when I first bought them that I'd use them a lot. I thought they'd become something that, um, because they're a pretty much industry standard for a lot of photographers and video producers. But the thing I don't like about them is the color cast. Now, having said that, this is the version one of the Loom Cubes. Um, they're very green. And for video, it's terrible on the face. Pretty much the same for lighting um, for photos. So I'm not a big fan of the Loom Cube, but that doesn't mean they're no good. It just means I'm not a big fan. I've got Loom Cube Minis here, and these are the same. The color temperature is the main problem with these. But apart from that, they do a really good job. One thing I like about this particular one is you can, it's got a magnet on the back. You can stick it onto something that's magnetic, uh, and it's quite handy for that. So uh, I'm not discounting them totally, and a lot of you will be using them for sure. They're just not quite as good in my mind for what I do as these other ones I'm showing you. Now, before I finish, I wanna show you this little tiny lantern. It's, it's a ripper. It's just this tiniest little light, hardly any light at all. But I use this when I open my aperture right up to get those really creamy bokeh looking shots. Now you'll see this image of the lantern on the fence post. I shot that with just this little light as the light source. It's hardly anything. Now I bought this at a camping store, didn't cost me much, a few dollars, uh, and I just have it in my camera bag for those times when I think I might need something a little bit different. And, and certainly uh, when I need something that's not quite as bright as the other light sources that I've got here. A lot of you asked me about the gel that I have on the front of my torch. You can see the torch has a gel there. And that is a half CTO gel. Now I've bought a roll of this stuff. As you can see, that's what it looks like. And it's not cellophane. It's also heat resistant. So it is proper theatre lighting paper, but it's also proper photographic gel. And it's what's known as half CTO gel. Now the gel on the front of these uh, Z96s is a full CTO. So that's, that's a denser orange than this one. Uh, it looks dense here because it's on a roll, but it is what I use to color balance the temperature of my camera to my lights. Now, that leads me to white balance. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about white balance. So when I'm shooting my nightscapes, I set my white balance in camera somewhere between 3800 Kelvin and usually up to about 4500 Kelvin. Now white balance is one of those settings in the cameras that confuses a lot of people. I don't want you to be confused. White balance is simply the camera's ability to work out what color white is. So once it works out and you can tell it what color you want it to be, therefore the variable um, Kelvin numbers. Kelvin, by the way, must have been a guy who lived many years ago. He invented what's known as a Kelvin scale. Now Kelvin, uh, the scale works to color and it works to temperature. And one way I like to illustrate this is if you have a fire and you've got these beautiful hot coals happening in the fire and you let it sort of die down a little bit, what color are those hot coals? They're yellow and orange. Now it's interesting because we typically look at orange light as being warm, but in an actually a temperature sense, orange is actually cool. Now, on the other hand, if you look at a gas jet on a gas stove and you fire it up, what color is it? It's blue. And we look at that gas fire and we think to ourselves, well, that's a much hotter flame than the coals in the fire, and yet it's blue. And in our thinking, we think blue light is cool light. Okay, so you've probably been to the hardware store and they'll talk about warm lights, warm white, and cool white, they're talking about color variation. So the reason cameras have white balance settings in them is so that we can match certain colors and so that we can match fluorescent lighting, we can match uh, candle light or incandescent light, we can match normal daylight, we can match uh, cloudy skies, which is a little bit different color again. There's all of these settings built in. Now, all of those settings relate to a Kelvin number. You can go right down to about 3,200 Kelvin, which is what this is listed at. This, with the orange gel, is 3,200 Kelvin. Without the orange gel, this light is about 5,600 Kelvin. You see what I'm saying? So the higher the number, the whiter the light is. The lower the number, the more orange the light is. So if I want to set my white balance in camera to, let me say, let's say 3,500 Kelvin, what happens is that the camera 
compensates for that manual setting and makes the image more blue. Some people like their night sky images to have a, a tinge of blue in the sky and be a little bit more mysteriously cool in that way. But the problem is if you want to light a foreground in front of that, the last thing you want is a terrible blue tone in all of our foreground. What we want our foreground to look like is a proper white balance, like a daylight white balance. So what we do, we gel our torch or our light source. And that's why you'll see all these gels that are on lights like this. Now, the thing is, once we set our white balance, and I suggest strongly to set white balance manually in the camera, because if you leave your camera on auto white balance, what will sometimes happen, especially when you're taking a sequence of images, you will get variation from one image to the next. And in a lot of cases that doesn't matter, but when it does matter is when you have things like time lapse or, or a star trial sequence or something like that. You don't want to have to adjust each one individually to get them back to the same color. My strong suggestion is to manually set your white balance. So if we set our white balance higher, let's just say we set our white balance at uh, 5000 Kelvin that image is going to look a lot more yellow. And uh, I know this is confusing because what I said before about the warmer image is actually the gas light, which is blue. It's actually compensating the opposite way around and that's how it works. So just, just remember these things. If I set my Kelvin temperature higher, in other words, 5,000 or 6,000 or 7,000, I'm actually warming up, putting more orange into the tone. If I set it lower, let's say 4,000, 3,500, 3,000 Kelvin, I'm making a bluer image. So if you want your sky to look at just a little bit of tinge of blue, you set your white balance down lower. Now I typically set my white balance, as I said, about 3,800 to 4,500 Kelvin, unless there's a moonlight. If there's moonlight in the sky, I would typically raise my white balance to about 5,000 Kelvin. Why do I do that? Because moonlight is actually a reflection of sunlight. So in fact, what you will find with moonlight, you will find that it actually makes the sky turn blue, the same as the sun does in the daytime. So I don't want the sky to look overly blue because of the moonlight. So what I'm going to do is change my white balance to compensate for that. And now I know this is complicated. It takes a lot of uh, time to get this to sink in. And there's a lot of articles out there on YouTube and elsewhere talking about white balance, but I hope that's helped you a little bit. And I can see hopefully the reasoning behind my selection of lights here, depending on what I'm trying to light and why I'm trying to do it, makes a little bit of sense to you guys. I mentioned before that many people like their nightscape images to look very natural. They don't particularly like the dramatic light painted look. And so they may well employ a technique known as low level lighting. Now, as the name implies, if you set a light source on a very low level, perhaps on a light stand and, and shine it on your subject for the full duration of your exposure, you are actually employing low level lighting. Or another term is architectural lighting. This concept has been around for years and many people favor this method as it's often less intrusive to others in the immediate area. In fact, in some locations around the world, lighting at night is being banned to help protect national park visitors and environments. Low level lighting can often be employed without any perceptible interference to others in the region. And yet the camera still sees the low level of light enough to light the landscape. It's amazing, isn't it? You can often use more than one light together in this manner, and the results are very effective. I'll often use the Z96 video lights as low level lights because they dim right down to almost nothing. And they have the orange magnetic gel attachments and, and that adds warmth to the shot. And to be honest, my use of low level lighting is, is pretty much more limited to a particular use in my nightscapes. For example, I like to use these lights inside buildings to give a warm glow an almost lived in fireplace look. And the other times I like to use them is to uplight trees as the branches will help diffuse the light and give a nice even glow over the leaves. As well as that, I'll often place them inside cars and trucks to give a special ambience to the image. There's no right or wrong way to use these lights. They're a tool to using whatever creative way you choose to. One of the other uses I have 
for low level lighting is when I'm shooting time lapse. One of the reasons for that is because I'm shooting hours of constant footage and therefore I need a consistent light source for any foreground subject matter that may be there placed in the shot. Low level lighting is perfect where I can leave lights on either one side or the other or sometimes both sides to achieve this. So now I want to talk to you about my most common way of lighting my foregrounds. Just a simple torch. Or, as my American friends would like to call it, a flashlight. Now I've been trying to perfect the art of light painting for many years, but I remember discovering this particular technique and being absolutely mesmerized by the creative possibilities it offered to me. Now the interesting thing about my lighting method in general is that I'm always trying to apply principles I've learned in portrait or even fashion and wedding photography along the way. But even more than that, I've spent a fair amount of time working in theatre and stage production, particularly the technical areas including lighting. The concept of lighting from angles and creating shape and definition is the cornerstone of stage and movie production. So I thought to myself, why not translate those well-known and practiced principles into my night landscape photography? Y you see, when shooting nightscapes, we have great liberty to be able to apply light wherever we want into our images. We aren't so constrained by where the sun is in the sky as our daytime landscape friends are. We can place the light source anywhere we want to to get the desired results. So that's how I think whenever I go out to shoot my nightscapes. I quickly worked out that to get the very best results, I had to work out how to address the noise issue I mentioned earlier. Now, remember I said that noise hides in the shadows. Yes, that's very true. But of course, noise is also present because of the very high ISOs required to shoot these nightscapes. And that's when I started experimenting with lighting multiple images from different angles or zones to create shape and character in my images. I want to preserve the shadows, but I'm also really keen to also maintain the highlights and at the same time not blow out the highlights. So the technique I use is what I affectionately call my fine art light painting method. This employs blending multiple images, background and foreground, to get even lighting. But not only that, it gives the ability to capture striking and vibrant lighting on both my night sky and foreground subjects. Most of the images you've seen of my work have been shot using this method. Some quite simple and others much more complex. You see, the complexity of the image is usually dictated to by the size of the scene and sometimes by the subject matter itself. Some things can be easily lit uh, with only one or two shots, while others need a whole lot more frames to get the desired result. The trick, however, is to make it look artistically realistic, no matter how many shots were needed to obtain it. Now, this is the key to the whole thing, really. Technique and process is very important, but it's not until we see something creative and artistic forming in our imagination, well, that's where we really see the magic. So, how do I get rid of the noise from my images? Well, to understand that, all we need to do is look at why there's noise there in the first place. When we shoot nightscapes, we can only apply a limited shutter speed because of the movement of the stars across the sky. Now, remember we talked about the 500 and the 300 rule back in episode one. Once we arrive at our maximum shutter speed and open up our aperture up as far as it can go, we still have quite an underexposed image. Now remember, we also referred to the exposure triangle back then. The only other parameter we can change is the ISO. When we wind that up to a high level, we will get noise in our images. Now it depends on our camera system how much we get, but I can guarantee you it will be there at high ISO. So let's think about it. Is the foreground moving? No, it's not. So we can shoot that at any shutter speed, can't we? Do we need to shoot the foreground at a wide open aperture and a high ISO? No, we do not. So suddenly we can do something wildly radical and change these settings to produce a clean and noise free image. And to do that, all we need is the correct application of light on our foreground subjects. Some of you will be thinking, but I, I like to take all my nightscapes in a single shot. I'm not into these blended or composite types of shots. In fact, that's cheating, I reckon. Well, I'm very sorry to tell you that you'll never ever get as clean a shot 
shooting single exposures, but you will get some excellent images and it will be a simpler capture process, no doubt. There's nothing wrong with that at all. My advice, however, is to open up your mind to the possibilities of trying something different. You may actually find that when you do that, your nightscape photography will start to change the way you think about things. You just never know. Most people who shoot nightscapes have come from a landscape photography background. And of course, these lighting concepts don't even come into the radar. It's all about the available light and whether it's good light or bad light. Gee, wouldn't it be good to be able to pick and choose our lighting conditions a bit more? Wow. So I think I need to gather all this info into a package together so it makes sense to you guys. Firstly, I'll shoot one or more frames of the Milky Way night sky, and these are at high ISO, wide apertures, and limited shutter speeds. Then, without moving my camera or tripod position, I'll stop down my aperture to somewhere between f4 and f8. Why do I do this? Well, two reasons. Firstly, at f5, for example, I'll have a much sharper image than one shot at, say, f1.8 or f2.8. That's because the outer part of my lens, which is where most of the aberrations live, isn't being used. Now, I've stopped down the lens, and that's how lenses work. Secondly, at f5, I've suddenly broadened my depth of field. This means that more of my foreground is in focus and will be sharper than when I had it set to f2.8. Remember we looked at the depth of field table in episode one and went through this focus info. Now remember way back in episode one, I showed you these round disks uh, and the reason I have these is to explain aperture. So let's see, look at this one. We've got an f1.4, this one is f2.8. We've got f5 and we've got f8 and a little tiny f16. Now, people ask me this all the time. Why, do, if I have, a, for example, an f1.8 lens, do I stop it down to f2.8 when I take my shots? Well, here is my explanation for that. Let's just say this is a f1.4. Well, it is f1.4 or f1.8, doesn't matter. And if I stop that lens down to f2.8, let's just show you the difference. That is f2.8. Now, if I stop it down to f2.8, what am I actually doing? What I'm doing is actually removing the outside part of the glass. That's pretty obvious from this uh, diagram. So effectively, what I'm doing, therefore, is meaning that the lens is operating through this center part. Now, if I stop it down, let's just say to f5, let's have a look at that. If I stop this lens down to f5, look at that. What am I doing there? I'm taking away all of the outside part of this glass. Now you would have heard this mentioned many times. People talk about the sweet spot of lenses. Now you might have an f1.4 uh, lens, but I can guarantee you its sweet spot is not wide open at f1.4. The sweet spot is going to be probably, you know, about f8 or f10 or f11 or something like that. No, so what we're doing by stopping down the aperture, let's just show you that one more time, is we're getting closer to the sweet spot of our lens. If we get close to the sweet spot of the lens, the lens operates far better than if we're trying to push it wide open. Now, I fully understand that a lot of these lenses are portrait lenses and they're designed to be shot wide open. But I'll tell you one thing, when you're shooting portraits, is that the outer edges of your frame are usually blurred out anyway because you're getting that bokeh look and all sorts of things. When we're shooting our nightscape, or landscapes for that matter, we don't want bokeh. We don't want uh, uh, aberrations around the edges of our lenses. So landscape photographers, daytime landscape photographers, they, they approach that by stopping down their lens. So they might have an f1.4 lens, but they're shooting it at f8. Now look at the difference. f8 is, is massively stopping down that lens. So us as nightscape photographers, we can't afford to go to f8 for the night sky because we need to get as much light gathering power as possible. So this is the conundrum that we're faced with. So what I'm saying to you guys now, if we've shot our night sky at maybe f1.4 or 1.8 or f2 or f2.8, that's fine. But when we're gonna shoot our foregrounds, we don't need the wide aperture lens. We can stop it down. And one of the apertures I like to stop down to is f5. Now you've seen a lot of my videos and my images, I'll stop down to f5. What am I doing? It's as simple as this. I am actually getting into the sweet spot 
of the lens. The images become sharper, they're more uh, in focus because I've actually increased the focus scale. Remember we talked about that earlier. So the more you stop down your lens, the wider your plane of focus becomes and you'll get more foreground in focus. Now I fully understand it takes a fair bit to get your head around all this stuff. Now I want you to remember that if the foreground subject is very close to the camera, you may have to refocus to make sure it's in focus. But stopping down the lens is often enough to get a beautiful sharp and in focus image. So the next step is to lower the ISO of the camera. Now remember I've been shooting at somewhere between ISO 3200 and maybe even 6400 to get those sky shots. But I'm going to lower it right down to about ISO 500 or so. Now why do I do that? It's to lower the noise level in my shots. And not only that, I've also had the side effect of increasing my camera's dynamic range. Now what is dynamic range? It's my camera's ability to capture the white whites and the black blacks. When you shoot images at high ISOs, you lose dynamic range and the blacks often turn into a muddy gray color and we don't want that. Okay, so now we have our camera ready to shoot and the only missing ingredient is light. All we need to do is apply enough light to correctly expose the shot. If we get it wrong, we can do it again. You see, we're not time limited here because our foreground isn't going anywhere. The sky will move on, but we've already captured that. We can spend all the time in the world to make sure we get the light right. My method is to light from different angles to make sure we have enough images to complete the total picture. When mixed with our Milky Way shot, the results are often simply breathtaking. All right, so that's a lot of detail to be taking in, especially for you creative types. Well, you just want to get out there and take an image. So let me illustrate how I would go about doing exactly that. Okay, now I want to talk to you about lighting and direction of lighting and shadows and shape and all those sorts of things. To do that, I've employed my very gracious assistant here, sit up straight, so that we can get a bit of an idea of how this works. So firstly, what I'm going to do is just shine a light directly on the front of this bear. The first thing we, we do is see that the light on the front of the bear is flat and harsh. Now, all we need to do is turn the angle of this light. You watch how the light changes. Suddenly, the light's beginning to wrap around the bear. And now the light's coming across the top. Now, let me just shine it on there. You can see how by just moving the light around to the side makes all the difference because it's the highlights are on this side and the shadows come around to this side, okay? We do the same thing around this way. You can see the highlights here on this side. Fall, the light falls off as it goes across the shape of the subject. All right, now the other thing I wanna bring your attention to here is I want you to have a look at the shadow behind. Now, when I'm lighting this with a small light source, which this torch is, the shadow is quite hard. You can see the definition there. It's very, very hard and solid. If I change the size of the light source LED panel, it's a little bit bigger. You can see the physical size difference between this one and that one. And when I put that on, you can see the shadow I'm talking about here is far softer in the background. Now, isn't that interesting? So let's put them together again so you can sort of get an idea. That's that one and that's that one. See how much harder the shadows are just because I've changed the light source and the size of the light source. Let's just say I bounce a light off this disc. So I'm making the light source not that size anymore, it's going to be this size. You just watch what happens this time. We'll do that. Now have a look at that. The shadow is almost just blending in to the background. Isn't that amazing? So that's exactly the principle that people use when they use umbrellas and soft boxes. They actually create softer light by making the light source bigger. Now in our nightscape photography, it's very, very difficult for us to actually do that out in the field. We can't be carrying great big soft boxes and umbrellas around. So one of the things I want to draw your attention to, we can't so much make the light softer on the subject, but what we can do is change the shadow and the shape of the light going around. So have a look at the shadow. Look what happens when I actually move 
the light source. Okay, I'm talking about lighting technique here. By moving the light source, the shadow is moving. If I have a long exposure photograph going, what's happening? That shadow is blurring. So it's softening the edges. It's not a harsh shadow anymore. It's a soft shadow. So when I'm lighting my foreground subjects, what I'm doing is moving the torch. I'm not just putting it onto the subject and leaving it there like that. Now, this is one of the disadvantages of using flash for lighting foregrounds because it gives a quite a, a hard shape. It's indiscriminate. It's not soft at all unless you put modifiers on the flashes. So one of the techniques that I always use when I'm lighting my foregrounds is to move the light source. Once again, let me put it into a nutshell for you. I'm not lighting from the front, same direction as the camera. I'm lighting off on angles like this. And by doing it, sometimes over the top like this, and by doing that, I'm also bringing that light source across the top of the bear, as you can see, giving it a bit of shape and character. Okay, uh, by moving the light from side to side, I'm changing the shadow and that falls off behind the subject. Now, sometimes you're shooting a, a landscape, you might be an object in the front, but you see all the shadows and the shadows look terrible. So by using this method, getting back over this side and doing the same thing, shadow is suddenly soft on the other side. So we don't have these hard edged shadows. And it's a typical of a lot of light painting you will see is the subjects lit, but there's also these awful shadows going off in all sorts of different directions. That's one way of alleviating that. And I think it's really good to be able to understand a little bit about how light, light works. Now, let me give you, there's three factors that come into this. So we're talking about uh, intensity, distance and time. So let me, let me illustrate it like this. The amount of light that is on this bear is determined by one, the intensity or the brightness of the light source. Okay, that's one of the factors. The second factor is how far I have the light source from the subject. So if I have it really close, it's gonna be really bright. If I take it right back to the other end of that room, it's gonna be quite dull. So keep that in mind. And the other thing is how much time is the light on the subject? So for example, if I just turn the light on and turn it back off again, that's one amount of light. If I turn it on and leave it on for a lot longer, obviously the subject is gonna be over lit. So when you're doing light painting, what you have to do is be aware of all of these things and there's a lot going through your brain. Now, this relates to what I said to you before about this mindset and how our brain controls everything. If we have these principles, in our head as a, I guess, as a locked in as a technical way of doing things, then we forget about that and we can start to create with the art form that is light painting. Light painting is an art form. Let me tell you, it, 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 it literally is art. And if we apply it as such, our images will turn out as artistic pieces. Now, if you think all this lighting stuff's complicated, you're spot on, it actually is. You see, nightscape photography is much harder to master compared to its daytime cousin. Why? Because we're not relying on the camera to do any of the work. We have to work it all out for ourselves. And not only that, we have to actually stop the camera from doing things that we don't want it to do. Yeah, it's hard work. But as I often say, practice makes perfect. Now, I do want to briefly mention using flashes in your nightscapes. I released a video a couple of weeks ago about this very topic, and it might be good for you to actually refer to that one. I typically don't use flash very often to light my nightscapes unless there are people in the frame. The reason for this is because I want to freeze any movement to get the people as sharp as possible. During a long exposure, it's really hard to keep the model perfectly still. In fact, it's impossible unless they're sitting or perhaps leaning on something. Now, because the flash fires in an instant, it gives a much more directional light source rather than the wrap around you can get from the torch method I illustrated before. Often people will use flash to light nightscapes in windy conditions. This is because, as I mentioned, it freezes the movement because of the instant burst of light. So it can be handy for trees or grass swaying in the foreground. So we've gone through a lot of detail here and I think it would be good to wrap it up with a summary of this light painting topic. Use standard LED lights. 
Low level lighting is best done with larger panels which are dimmable and placed out of the frame. Handheld torches which are zoomable work best for fine art light painting work. Use gels to balance out the colour of the LED lights as they tend to be more blue in tone. Never light your subjects from directly behind the camera. Use angles to create shadow and texture in the foreground subjects. Light from low down, especially over grass and shrubs. Flashes work best when shooting portrait style nightscapes featuring people. Remember, the three things that determine our lighting, intensity of light, distance of the light source, and how much time the light is applied for. And so there you have it, lighting for nightscape images. There's a lot to it and I've got quite a few videos which hopefully will help you remember the techniques and principles moving forward. And I'll link those below in the description. Now, don't forget to download the free RAW files from the website, link below, and you can see how you go about blending these images together. There are plenty of videos which show help with that process already on my channel. Now speaking of blending images, next week we'll be looking at that very subject. I want to go through focus stacking and blending images using Lightroom and Photoshop. So if you're having trouble with any of that, I'll see if I can be of assistance to you guys next week. Anyway, until I see you again, thanks so much for tuning in and I'm always very keen to correspond with you in the comments down below. So I'll see you guys next time.